Collins English for Exams, speaking for IELTS. Copyright Harper Collins Publishers, 2011. CD2, Track One, One. How long have you lived here? Two. Have you ever eaten Italian food? Three. What has happened in the news today? Four. What have you done so far today? Track two, one. I've played the clarinet since I was a child. Or, I've been playing the clarinet since I was a child. Two. I've only been scuba diving twice. Three. I've known her for three and a half years. Four. I've read your book. You can have it back now. Five. I've been watching TV all morning. I'm so lazy. Track three, one. How long have you been doing your favourite hobby? Two. How many times have you engaged in your hobby this week or this year? Three. Have you had less time for your hobby since you started studying for IELTS? Track four, hobbies. Do you think men and women tend to have different types of hobbies? Why do some people get obsessed with their hobby? Do you think hobbies that keep you fit are better than hobbies that you can do sitting down? Free time. Do you think it can be a disadvantage to have too much free time? Should people feel a duty to do something constructive in their free time? Do people have more free time now than in the past? Sample answer. Do you think men and women tend to have different types of hobbies? Um. Yes, I do. The men I know have sports as hobbies. The women usually enjoy more sedentary and peaceful hobbies, like、um, reading or crafts. Having said that, there are of course women who love exhilarating hobbies, or are fanatical about cycling or something. And there are men who take up pottery or sewing. There are always exceptions to every rule. Why do some people get obsessed with their hobby? I think everybody finds at least one thing absolutely fascinating. It can be anything, subjects like、um, history of art, or a sport like basketball, or a craft like、um, card making. Everyone is different, and one person's interest can appear strange to other people. However, not everyone has time to indulge themselves with their hobby. Mothers of young children, for example, get little free time, and so they appear less obsessed than a single man who spends every weekend, all weekend, playing computer games. Do you think hobbies that keep you fit are better than hobbies that you can do sitting down? No, I think hobbies that open you up to new things are the best, ones that enrich you and give you a new skill. That can be anything. But it is important always to grow as a person and not become boring by never trying anything new. Do you think it can be a disadvantage to have too much free time? <laughs> well, they say that the devil makes work for idle hands, and I think it's true that the less you have to do, the less active you become, and the more time you waste. People who have too much time to spare tend to become lazy and, and lethargic. People who are always on the go, on the other hand, think nothing of fitting one more thing into their busy schedules. Should people feel a duty to do something constructive in their free time? No, not necessarily. Everyone deserves some downtime. Modern life is stressful and hectic, and so we need times when we let go of our responsibilities and just do something fun. We can still draw benefits from hobbies that are not generally considered constructive. Um, for example, we can develop our abilities to work in teams by doing team sports, and we can increase our attention spans by、um, reading a novel with long chapters.
Do people have more free time now than in the past? It's a strange irony that although we now have so many labour-saving devices such as washing machines and、um, dishwashers, we feel we have less free time. Many of my acquaintances are always complaining that they are too busy, but actually, I think our ancestors had less free time than us. The average worker hardly ever got any time off and worked six or seven days a week. Track five. Uh. Track six. Author. Yoga. Today. England. Summer. Internet. Collection. Suppose. Person. Gardening. Leisure. Photography. Famous. Opinion. Track seven. A. Repeat, please. B. Could you say that again, please? C. What? D. What did you say? Track eight. Would you mind repeating the question? Would you mind repeating the question? Track nine. I'm sorry. I'm not sure I understand the question. Track ten. I'm afraid I don't know what recreation means. Track eleven. One. When I hear music from the seventies, it really takes me back. It makes me feel like I'm a teenager again. The memories are so vivid. So many things from that period of my life left a lasting impression on me, like meeting my first girlfriend and sitting my A levels in sweltering heat. It's still fresh in my mind. Two. I can barely remember what I did yesterday, let alone events from my childhood. Well, having said that, I have some vague memories. I remember a teacher I really liked called um, oh, that the name escapes me, but she was so brilliant at explaining things and was really kind when my brother was taken ill. Oh, what was her name? It's on the tip of my tongue. Yeah, anyway, as I said, I have a bad memory. Three. I often reminisce about the good old days. You have to be careful, though, because it's easy to get sentimental and see everything through rose-tinted glasses. Things weren't perfect back then, but you often only remember the good times. I love looking at old photos. They remind me of people I'd long forgotten about, and then it all comes flooding back, like my old friend Alice, who passed away ten years ago. Can it really be that long? Doesn't time fly? Track twelve, one. Most children I know are well brought up. Two. I had a strict upbringing. Three. Good parenting is all about teaching a child to have good manners. Four. When I was young, I respected my elders. Five. When I was a child, my dad told me off more often than my mum. Six. I always did as I was told. Seven. Children in my country generally help around the house. Track thirteen. What is your most vivid childhood memory? Are you still in touch with your childhood friends? What was your favourite toy when you were a child? Is it important for children to have fun? Why? Sample answer. What is your most vivid childhood memory? 
Without a doubt, it's getting my two pet tortoises for my sixth birthday. It was such a surprise, and I was so pleased because none of my friends had such unusual pets. They were tiny. They could both sit in the palm of my hand, and I really enjoyed looking after them. Are you still in touch with your childhood friends? Some of them, yes. We've all moved on and have very different lives now, but it's nice to catch up from time to time and reminisce. You may have more in common with more recent friends,、uh, but childhood friends feel almost like brothers and sisters, and there's something very special about that relationship. What was your favourite toy when you were a child?、Mm. I always liked toys other children had. For example,、um, a toy car garage with various levels and ramps. <laughs> That was great fun. My best friend had it, and whenever I went over to his house, I would ask to play with it. Sometimes he didn't want to, so I played with it on my own. I loved making the cars whiz around the tracks and crash into each other. Is it important for children to have fun? Um, it is important because I believe children learn a lot through play.、Mm, they learn about the world around them. They learn how to interact with other people. They learn about possible dangers through acting them out. Children shouldn't be made to grow up too fast. They should be allowed to experience the world of make believe first. They spend long enough in the real world as adults. Track fourteen. Sample answer. I grew up very far from most of my family, so I only saw them once a year. Every summer, I would go to stay with them while my parents continued working. Although I missed my parents, I used to really enjoy spending time with my grandparents, cousins, aunts, and uncles. I spent all summer there, nearly two whole months. So from time to time, my cousins and I would get bored. We would ask my grandparents if they had any ideas for interesting things we could do. Sometimes they suggested、uh, going for a bike ride. Sometimes into town to do some shopping. At other times, they showed us a new game to play. <laughs> Then we were happy again. One day. Oh, must be about twenty-five years ago. <laughs> Doesn't time fly? All of us got really, really bored, and we kept complaining to my grandparents. They were tearing their hair out trying to think up ideas of where we could go and what we could do. Suddenly, my granddad came up with the idea of going to a new water park that had opened that summer. I hadn't heard about it, but my cousins had, and they told me all about it. It was a park with、uh, vast numbers of different pools. Some inside, some outside. There were water slides as well, and、uh, on top of that, there was not one but two playgrounds with swings,、uh, a merry-go-round, and seesaws. <laughs> we were so excited. We set off, and on the way, we were all singing songs and laughing. We couldn't wait to get there. When we arrived, my cousins and I ran into the park and changed into our swimming costumes. Then we went looking for the most exciting-looking pool, and we found it—one with brightly coloured tiles and slides. We jumped straight in. We played all day in the park and had a lovely lunch. Sat on some benches in the sunshine. <laughs> my granddad loved a pool. That was filled with spa water. It was dark brown and stank of rotten eggs. I didn't want to go in, but he eventually convinced me. I'm pleased he did because the water was really warm. I'd never swam in water that warm. I didn't want to get out, despite the terrible smell. I consider it such a happy memory because we enjoyed ourselves so much, and I remember so vividly how I felt that day. But there's more to it than just that. When I look back now, I understand how caring my grandparents were, and、oh, how much they wanted us all to be happy. They would have done anything to help us have a good time. 
I appreciate that more now that I'm older and have children of my own. I hope we thank them. I can't remember. But anyway, they were content, I'm sure, to just watch us having an amazing time playing and laughing in the water. So, as you can see, it was a wonderful day and is one of my favourite childhood memories. What other activity did you used to enjoy when you were staying with your family? I loved going for walks in the local park. There were people selling all kinds of delicious foods from carts, so my grandparents would invariably buy us some treat, like、uh, homemade ice cream or cakes. Track 15 Enjoyed Worked Acted Track 16 Left column. Aged. Agreed. Answered. Breathed. Cycled. Loved. Played. Seemed. Middle column. Asked. Helped. Laughed. Matched. Thanked. Wished. Right column. Accepted. Decided, hated, needed, pretended, wanted. Track seventeen. A. Same. Aim. Day. O. Home. Boat. I. Time. Fly. Night. O. Cloud. Cow. Oi. Choice. Boy. Ear. Peer. Mirror, hear. Air, pair, stare. Track eighteen. I remember my granddad often used to take me to school when I was little. I used to live quite far from my school, and my granddad let me cycle there, following behind me on foot. I kept stopping to wait for him to catch up. Then, when we had arrived at school, he would push my bike home again. One day, I was cycling along happily. Suddenly, I looked back, and my granddad was nowhere to be seen. I waited and waited, but he didn't come. I began to get worried, so I cycled back the way I had come, and to my horror, found him lying on the ground. He had tripped on some loose paving. I helped him up and then took him to the doctor's. Although he kept insisting he was fine, the doctor examined him and luckily he wasn't injured.、Oh, I was so relieved and always cycled more slowly after that. Track nineteen, childhood. Do you think people often idealise their childhoods? How does a person's childhood influence what kind of adult they become? When does a child become an adult, in your view? Upbringing. Do you agree with the saying, "Children should be seen and not heard"? Is it good for children to be exposed to frightening and sad experiences, or should they be protected from these as far as possible? Are children in your country generally well brought up? 
Sample answer. Do you think people often idealise their childhoods? Certainly they do. The older we get, the more nostalgic we get about the past. It's only normal. And why should we dwell on the negatives? I don't think it does any harm to idealise a bit if it makes us happy to remember things in a more positive light. The only danger is that it may make us unhappy with our current lots to believe that everything was so much better back then. How does a person's childhood influence what kind of adult they become? Well,、uh, I suppose the adult you become is influenced by three main factors. Firstly, your childhood. That is、uh, nurture, then、uh, your genes. That is nature, and last but not least, the choices you make as an adult.、Uh, to my mind, of all three, nurture has the greatest impact. They've conducted research on twins who were separated at birth, and while there are undoubtedly many similarities between them, they are also very different in many key ways.、Um, their success in the world of work. Their relationships with other people. I think all this is influenced by the role models we have throughout our childhoods. When does a child become an adult, in your view? Hmm, that's a difficult question to answer, and all societies grapple with this issue. It is, of course, critical for the criminal justice system to define an adult correctly, or at least try to, because if somebody commits a crime as a child. They get treated more leniently than if they commit a crime as an adult. So,、uh, I suppose you have to decide when you think people become fully responsible for their actions. I wouldn't want to be the one making that decision. I just don't know. Do you agree with the saying "children should be seen and not heard"? I'm assuming this means that children should respect their elders and not create havoc by being noisy and answering adults back. I have some sympathy with this view. However, moderation is usually the best course to take in all things, as with upbringing. Children should respect their elders, which involves doing as they're told.、Uh, too many children nowadays think they run the household, making demands, etc. However, it is also true that a child is part of the family too, and also deserves respect. I think this means they should be allowed to express their points of view, and、uh, they should be listened to and consulted. It's a fine balance, I suppose. Is it good for children to be exposed to frightening and sad experiences, or should they be protected from these as far as possible? I don't think they should experience too many sad or terrifying experiences if it can be helped. Nevertheless, what is very useful for teaching children about these. Darker sides of life, without scarring them, is stories. In stories, they can learn about evil and the dangers in the world around them, but in a controlled way, where the baddies are punished and everyone ends up happy. This gives them a focus for the fears that all children have, but、uh, it is a fictional one, so it doesn't upset their peace of mind. Are children in your country generally well brought up? My instinct is to say no, because you see many misbehaving children when you're out and about. In reality, there are probably many more well-brought-up children than badly brought-up ones. It's just that the good children don't attract your attention as much. Track twenty, one. Back in the nineteen sixties, this was a nice place to live. Everyone knew everyone, and. People looked out for each other. I'm sorry to say that since the sixties, the population has risen dramatically, and this has led to a breakdown in the community ties that used to unite us. Also, second homeowners buy holiday homes here, and that has meant that the price of property has escalated in recent years, forcing young people to move away from the area. Two. My city is becoming more and more vibrant as time goes on. <laughs> I love it. It used to be really dull with nothing much for young people to do, but now bars and clubs have begun opening up. 
the city's no longer just for the older generations with theaters and museums. It's got a new lease of life with a great nightlife and an increasing student population to enjoy it. Three. A century ago, this town was a hive of activity with its many factories and its port. Nowadays, however, it's nowhere near as bustling as manufacturing has moved elsewhere. But I, for one, don't bewail the changes. There's a certain poignancy and beauty to the disused industrial architecture. And, in fact, many of the old factories are being converted into flats and they're extremely popular with trendy young couples who are now moving into the town. Track 21 Tell me about your hometown. In what ways has your town or city changed since you were a child? How could your town or city be improved? Are there any traffic problems where you live? Sample answer. Tell me about your hometown. It's a biggish town in the south of the country with a population of about 150,000. When I was growing up, I always thought my hometown was all right, but now that I've travelled more widely, I know I wouldn't want to live there anymore. In what ways has your town or city changed since you were a child? Well, um, crime has been on the increase since the early 90s. My friends who still live there no longer feel that safe. Also, it has become very congested and traffic is a real problem. When I visit it now, it makes me quite sad thinking how things used to be. How could your town or city be improved? Well, the city where I live now is beautiful and it's hard for me to think of any way in which it could be improved. I suppose if I had to find something, I'd say that it has mainly chain restaurants and shops so we could do with a greater range of independent places. It would make eating out and shopping more enjoyable. Are there any traffic problems where you live? Yes, but I think there are traffic problems everywhere in this country, certainly in all the towns and cities. Here, public transport is really expensive, so everyone drives, and that means we have standstill traffic during the rush hour. They should increase the affordability of the buses. Track 22 Sample Answer a place that I enjoy visiting is Graz. It's the second largest city in Austria, with a population of around 300,000. It lies in the southeast of the country, in the state of Styria, which is a green, lush part of Austria. There is lots to do in Graz. It has several universities, so first and foremost, it's a fantastic place to be a student. Uh, it's buzzing with a good nightlife, uh, good restaurants and a lively cultural life. In fact, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site and Europe's capital of culture a few years back. If you climb up to the hill overlooking the old town, uh, you have an amazing view of the city. What strikes me most when I go up there is all the traditional pale buildings with their red roofs. And then right in the middle of it all, a remarkable piece of contemporary architecture, the Museum of Modern Art. It looks like a huge sea cucumber, completely out of keeping with all the architecture around it, but of course totally in keeping with what it houses, modern art. I always think how brave it was of the Austrians to put it there, in the heart of the city, and how unlikely it was that that sort of thing would ever be allowed where I live. I really admire them for it, and I think the building has its own kind of beauty. The last time I went to Graz, they were having a wine festival. People were tasting all kinds of wines from stalls on the street, very informally, and chatting with friends while they drank. It was wonderful. How has it changed since I first visited it? Uh, well, I would say it has undoubtedly become more trendy. 
Like I say, they have built a stunning new museum. Uh, they have also built an island in the river, which is actually a floating platform holding a cafe and a playground. To go with the sea cucumber theme, this one is shaped like a seashell. I would say the local inhabitants have become more overtly proud of their city too. It has received quite a bit of recognition in recent times, which has really placed Graz well and truly on the cultural map, something the inhabitants are always happy to talk to you about. In fact, that is something else I enjoy about going there. The local people are invariably friendly and helpful. When did you last go to Graz? Um, I last went there the year before last. I wish I could go more often, uh, but unfortunately work commitments mean I can't. Track 23 Leicester Newcastle Reading Greenwich Plymouth Cambridge Track 24 1. Island 2. Calm 3. Camera 4. Half 5. Interesting 6. Vineyard 7. Walk 8. Wednesday 9. Foreigner 10. Restaurant Track 25 Home Is it only children who experience homesickness? Do you think it's better for children to grow up in the city or the country? Why do some people retire to the countryside? Patriotism Are people from your country patriotic? Why do people often feel proud of where they come from? Does intense patriotism have any disadvantages? Sample answer Is it only children who experience homesickness? Children probably feel homesickness more acutely because they may never have been away from home before and because they are still closely attached to their parents. They cannot appreciate the cultural insights of a new place or the time off work the way an adult can and they are generally less flexible when it comes to coping with unfamiliar food and so on. However, many adults also experience culture shock when they visit a new place, which I suppose can be considered a kind of adult homesickness. We find a place strange and even slightly disturbing, and this is because it is different to what we are used to. So, in a sense, we miss our familiar surroundings and are indeed homesick. Do you think it's better for children to grow up in the city or the country? Mm, I think the perfect solution is to live in the countryside close to a major cultural centre, by which I mean a big city. This means that the child can enjoy all the pleasures of country life, um, the farm animals, uh, the fresh air, the relative safety, whilst at the same time not being too far from all the fun that can be had in the city, um, musicals, kids' museums, zoos. Kids need to be exposed to a wide range of situations and settings, and experiencing just the city or just the countryside is, is limiting. Why do some people retire to the countryside? I suppose they crave the peace and quiet after a lifetime of hard work in the hustle and bustle of the city. In fact, in the modern imagination, I think the city is associated with work and the country with relaxation. Of course, people like farmers do work in the countryside, so it's not an altogether accurate picture. But nevertheless, it is how the two opposing settings are often regarded. Are people from your country patriotic? Mm, on the whole, I would say yes, they are. I think most people in the world are patriotic. 
You can see this at the Olympics, where thousands of people go to support their country's sports people and millions, if not billions more, watch from the comfort of their own homes, cheering their countrymen on and willing them to win. It's a very powerful force, patriotism, and has been responsible for much good and bad. But I think the Olympics shows us the best and most inclusive side of patriotism. Why do people often feel proud of where they come from?、Um, people feel the need to belong to a club, to a family,、uh, to a group of friends,、uh, to a region, and to a country. Where you come from is tied up with so many other things that it says an awful lot about you, and so is of the utmost importance in defining who you are.、Uh, for example, it affects what you eat. What language you speak, and how you behave towards others, being proud of where you are from is therefore an extension of being proud of who you are. Does intense patriotism have any disadvantages? Oh, undoubtedly, the flip side of patriotism is xenophobia. People disliking others who are from another country and associating all kinds of negative characteristics with them. People are capable of believing that everyone from that country over there is mean, rude, and dirty, etc. It's quite frightening, really, because it could be argued that xenophobia has made it easier for governments to justify going to war with other nations over the centuries. Track twenty six, one. Patriotism is a terrible thing. Well, let me rephrase that. Patriotism is not always a force for good. Two. Patriotism is a terrible thing, or more accurately, patriotism is not always a force for good. Track twenty-seven, one. My house is too small. <laughs> What I mean is that it is too small for our family, because there are so many of us. For an average-sized family, it would do very well. Two. My house is too small, or to put it another way, it is too small for our family because there are so many of us. For an average-sized family, it would do very well. Track twenty-eight. People from my village are suspicious of foreigners. In other words, they're xenophobic. Track twenty-nine. People in the past were not so mobile. My grandparents, for example, lived all their lives in the town where they were born. People in my country like foreign cuisine. Korean restaurants are very popular, for instance, as are Chinese restaurants. Track thirty. What is the most important festival in your country? Do you think this festival will still be as important in the future? Tell me how weddings are celebrated in your country. What are some forms of traditional dancing in your country? Sample answer. What is the most important festival in your country? Our most important festival is, without doubt, Christmas. We all look forward to it for months,、uh, buying presents for our loved ones and decorating our homes. It's magical for everyone, but for children especially.、Um, when we knew Father Christmas was about to visit, my sister Samantha and I were always too excited to sleep. Do you think this festival will still be as important in the future? Ah,、uh, yes, I think so. I think people often forget the true meaning of Christmas, though. I mean, they don't think about the story of the birth of Jesus. And in the future, they'll probably remember it even less. They、uh, see it more as a time for buying and receiving presents. Tell me how weddings are celebrated in your country. Oh、uh, well, the wedding party is the most interesting bit. After the ceremony, everyone has a huge meal and then dances all night,、uh, sometimes to traditional music played by a band. Sometimes just to pop music played by a DJ. I prefer the traditional music because you can hear pop music any time, 
And the old, traditional songs have so much meaning and history behind them. The older generation always know all the words, so they sing along. What are some forms of traditional dancing in your country? Uh, folk dancing is quite popular, even among young people. The dancers wear traditional costume, which looks beautiful. My favourite is a circle dance performed by women, um, but there's also a marching dance and a couple dance. I'm afraid I don't know anything about the choreography of these dances. I just know I like watching them. Track 31 Our most important festival is, without doubt, Christmas. We all look forward to it for months, buying presents for our loved ones and decorating our homes. It's magical for everyone, but for children especially. When we knew Father Christmas was about to visit, my sister Samantha and I were always too excited to sleep. Track 32 Our most important festival is without doubt Christmas. We all look forward to it for months, uh, buying presents for our loved ones and decorating our homes. It's magical for everyone, but for children especially. Um, when we knew Father Christmas was about to visit, my sister Samantha and I were always too excited to sleep. Track 33 In England Most Important Track 34 The End I Ate Track 35 Too Often So Amazing Track 36 Far Away I Saw It Track 37 Sample Answer I love Guy Fawkes Night. It's a British celebration held on the 5th of November every year. The origins of it are really fascinating, a story of intrigue and deception. In 1605, Guy Fawkes planted some gunpowder under the Houses of Parliament. He wanted to blow up the government and the king, but he was caught. He was tortured and executed for treason. People lit bonfires to celebrate the fact that King James had survived and the government made the day a national day of thanksgiving. People still light bonfires to this day and for this reason the festival is sometimes called Bonfire Night. A cloth guy is put on top of the bonfire and burned. People also set off fireworks in their back gardens or they attend public firework displays. When I was younger, my dad would set off fireworks in our garden and I would be terrified. They were so loud they made me jump, but I had to try and hide it because he had gone to a lot of trouble to prepare and light the fireworks for us. Our cat hated bonfire night and would hide behind the sofa for hours on end. I love this festival for many reasons. Firstly, it brings some colour and excitement to an otherwise very dark time of year. Then. I love the story behind it. It's so much more fascinating than the stories behind other festivals. Last but not least, I love the fact that it's a major celebration that is particular to the British. I don't think the British are too good at national celebrations, probably a result of our Puritan past, but the 5th of November is a valued exception. It also amuses me that while the French celebrate Bastille Day, the anniversary of when revolutionaries stormed the Bastille prison, representing royal authority, we celebrate Guy Fawkes Night, the anniversary of when a plan to kill the king failed and the status quo was upheld. It says quite a lot about the differences between our cultures. Do you think everyone in Britain knows about the origins of the festival? Yes, I do. There's even a rhyme to help you remember. Remember, remember the 5th of November, gunpowder treason and plot. I see no reason why gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. Track 38 
This year, I'm spending New Year with my boyfriend's family. We're arriving on the 28th of December and staying till the 4th of January. I'm really looking forward to it. Track 39 We're flying to France next week. I'm meeting my friend John for lunch today. My mum's starting her new job on Monday. Track 40 I'm It's He's She's You're There We're Track 41 A England are going to lose in the cricket again. B That woman's going to trip. C Do you think it's going to snow? Yes, definitely. Track 42 1 He'll call you when he gets there. Don't worry. 2 I hope we'll be able to go out today. It hasn't stopped raining. 3. In the future, people will live for much longer than they do now. 4. I think I'll visit my grandmother this weekend. 5. I'm not sure I follow you. I'll explain it again. Track 43 People in my country are becoming less religious, so I think that by 2050, People will have forgotten about the origins of Christmas. Track 44. Historical Sites Are historical sites in your country popular with visitors? Is it more important to preserve historical sites or make way for the developments of the future? What do you think will happen to your country's historical sites in the future? Culture Past, present and future. What is culture for you? Do you think that it is important for a society or culture to have a sense of continuity with the past? How will your country's culture have changed in 50 years' time? Sample answer. Are historical sites in your country popular with visitors? They seem to be very popular, yes. Um, the last time I went to visit a historical site myself, I was struck by the number of families there with young children. I don't think these sites are popular with young couples necessarily, but it looks to me as though when those couples have children, they suddenly develop a new appreciation for those places. And uh, I suppose they think that finding out about the history of their region and country is an important component in bringing up their children. Is it more important to preserve historical sites or make way for the developments of the future? When a developer wants to build a new shopping centre in my country, for example, they are obliged to conduct an archaeological survey. If any remains are found, archaeologists have to be given time to study it. I think this is marvellous. So, uh, I think old and new can work side by side and you don't necessarily have to choose between them. What do you think will happen to your country's historical sites in the future? Mm. I think many of them will continue to be given funding because people realise that you can make lots of money by attracting visitors to historical sites. On the other hand, some are so dilapidated that they require enormous amounts of investment and I'm not sure they will survive into the future. Some old manor houses, for example. What is culture for you? <laughs> culture can be defined as the way of life of a particular society or section of society. It involves their customs and traditions. And so in some senses, culture is what distinguishes us from others. What makes us unique. I think culture is also what connects us to our past, to our heritage. Um, we mustn't forget modern culture either, though. Youth culture is often very vibrant and powerful with its new and inventive forms of music, dress and art. Do you think that it is important for a society or culture to have a sense of continuity with the past? Yes, definitely. 
Change is necessary, but it is also frightening. For this reason, people continue to rely on their traditions to give them a sense of their roots and to remind them of where they've come from. Commemorating the past is also a way of bringing people together, such as during Independence Day. How will your country's culture have changed in 50 years' time? Hmm, we are becoming more and more multicultural, so I'm not sure that all of our traditions will survive in their current form. For example, can we continue to regard Christmas as our major annual celebration if perhaps half of the country does not have Christianity as its religion? It would be a shame to lose our traditions. However, if that is indeed the case, something new will, I'm sure, have replaced them in 50 years' time. And maybe it is better to develop new customs and celebrations that more accurately reflect modern society. Track 45. 1. Would you feel nervous about going on holiday alone? 2. Do you enjoy travelling with your family? 3. Are you scared of flying? 4. Have you been away this year? 5. Do you like to try and learn the language of the country you're travelling to? 6. Are there any differences between what young people like to do on holiday and what older people like to do? 7. Did you have a good time on your last holiday? 8. Do you mind roughing it? 9. If you won a million pounds, would you spend it on a round-the-world trip? Track 46 is your country popular with tourists? What sites and activities would you recommend to a tourist visiting your town or region? Do you enjoy active holidays? Tell me what your ideal holiday would be. Sample answer. Is your country popular with tourists? Oh, yes, it is. It's a key tourist destination. It isn't popular with sun seekers because, well, <laughs> we don't get a lot of sun. Uh, but people who are into culture and history love it. We get millions of visitors every year. What sites and activities would you recommend to a tourist visiting your town or region? Uh, there are a great number of ancient sites near here. Uh, for example, burial mounds and stone circles. They're fascinating, and I wouldn't hesitate to recommend them to anyone. Luckily, it's actually better if the weather is misty or dismal when you're visiting those sites, because it just adds to the atmosphere. Do you enjoy active holidays? Yes, I certainly do. I hate just sitting on a beach. I love hiking. Uh, last year, I went hiking in Nepal with some friends. Oh, it was incredibly tough, but really rewarding, and I got very fit and trim. We want to do something similar next year, if we can save enough money. Tell me what your ideal holiday would be. Hmm, my ideal holidays are when I discover new things. So, I wouldn't say I have one ideal holiday in mind. Um, but it's true that I would love to go to South America, uh, especially Peru. I believe it's great for hikers, and the landscape just looks breathtaking. I speak some Spanish too, so I could communicate with the locals. Track 47. Sample answer. I'd like to tell you about the time I went backpacking around Spain. I can't quite believe it, but it was over a decade ago now. Two friends and I got very good value rail passes and travelled around Spain for three months. It was an unforgettable experience. We uh, started off in Madrid, because that's where we landed. We did some sightseeing, we especially loved the parks, and we ate and drank lots. Our um, favourite thing was, of course, the delicious ham. 
We liked the nightlife in Madrid too, not least eating out. It was a real experience. The locals don't go out to dinner until really late, often as late as 11 p.m. I suppose because it's so hot. So if you turn up at a restaurant at what would be a normal time where we come from, the place is either closed or completely empty. We then journeyed on to Santiago de Compostela in the northwest, which was fabulous. And my friend is really into art, so we had to visit the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao in the north. The weather was dreadful while we were there, so we didn't get the best impression. But even so, we enjoyed it. More people should visit that part of Spain. Then we moved on to、um, Barcelona, Madrid's rival city. We fell in love with it. It's so different to Madrid,、um, more bohemian in feel and more multicultural. The Gaudi architecture is so wonderfully wacky, looking half the time like it's fallen off the page of a fairy tale. We were quite sorry to leave Barcelona. After that, we saw Valencia, but not for long, unfortunately. And then we went on to Granada.、Oh, what a beautiful, beautiful place! There is nothing quite like the Moorish palace, the Alhambra, lit up at night. The image has stayed with me. We had wanted to visit Seville and the Extremadura region of the country, but we'd run out of money by then, so sadly we had to leave. It was a memorable holiday because I was with two good friends, experiencing all these amazing cities. I don't think I could do it now because traveling so much in a relatively short time is tiring. But we were young and carefree, and so took it in our stride. It was the holiday of a lifetime. Why did you choose to go to Spain? Well.、Um, One of my friends spoke Spanish really well, so it seemed the obvious choice. I don't like going to a country without speaking any of the language, and my friend taught us both Spanish as we travelled round the country. So by the end, we could order our food ourselves and talk to people, albeit not on any complex subjects. Track forty-eight. A. I wanted to go, but I couldn't. I was broke. B. Did you say her name was Julie? No, Julia. C. My husband really enjoyed the mini break, but I didn't. D. Was your purse on the table when it was stolen? No, it was under the table. Track forty-nine. One. I gather you're from New Zealand. Two. Saudi Arabia has an extremely cold climate. Three. Is the capital of England Tokyo? Four. Scotland lies to the south of England. Track fifty. I do think it is unfair that we visit these countries without a thought for what impact tourism has on the local population. I do like travelling abroad, but I also don't mind spending my holidays relaxing at home. Track fifty-one, A. Although it's more expensive, many people do go abroad for their holidays. B. We nearly decided not to go to South Africa, but in the end we did go. C. I do love being able to lie in when I'm on holiday. Track fifty-two, the benefits of travel. Do you think it's true that travel broadens the mind? Do young people and older people benefit differently from travelling? How can you make sure you get the most from your travels? The impact of tourism. What are the positive impacts of tourism? What about the negative impacts of tourism? How has tourism impacted tourist sites in your country? Sample answers. 
Do you think it's true that travel broadens the mind? I do, yes. I wouldn't want to disparage people who haven't travelled, because that is almost invariably due to a lack of opportunity. I doubt any of my great grandparents' generation ever travelled anywhere. But I can't help but think that it does make you a, a more open minded person as you see different ways of living, eating, drinking, interacting with others, and it allows you to see your own culture more objectively. It also leads to you having a wider range of experiences. And makes you more interesting to talk to. Do young people and older people benefit differently from travelling? I think younger people tend to enjoy adventure and having fun, and older people value relaxation more because they have so many responsibilities at home that what they want more than anything is to switch off when they go away. Of course, that's a generalization and only takes you so far. I know it's true of me, though. How can you make sure you get the most from your travels? I've always thought learning something of the language of the country you're going to is the best possible way of benefiting fully from your holiday. That way, the local population aren't so likely to see you as an outsider. But rather, as someone who has made the effort of learning some words and expressions, and so has an interest in their culture. What are the positive impacts of tourism? They're manifold. Tourism brings investment and better infrastructure to poorer communities. This means that tourists find it easier to get around. But it also leads to an improved quality of life for the local people. It also brings about greater work opportunities for the local community. Previously, for example, they may just have had fishing or farming, but tourism opens up the possibility of higher earning jobs. What about the negative impacts of tourism? Well, I've seen areas where large numbers of visitors have had a detrimental effect on local habitats. For example, coral reefs in the Caribbean. It's really tragic. The best solution, as far as the wildlife is concerned, would be to ban tourism for a few decades to let the reefs recover. But, of course, the local economy has come to rely on tourism. And there would be an uproar if the government were to take that drastic step. How has tourism impacted tourist sites in your country? I think because my country is not a big tourist destination yet, the small number of visitors we get have had only a positive effect. For example, small souvenir shops now have a larger clientele because of the visitors coming to see our temples. Track fifty-three, practice exam. Hello, my name is Pauline Jenkins. Could you tell me your full name, please? Thank you. Can you show me your identification, please? All right, that's fine. I'd now like to ask you some questions about yourself. Tell me about where you live. What are the advantages of living there? What are the disadvantages of living there? We're now going to talk about animals. What is your favourite animal? Why do you think some people like keeping pets? Are there any animals you're scared of? Are zoos popular in your country? Let's move on to talk about food. Do you think men or women make the best cooks? Is it important to teach children to cook from a young age? What is a typical dish from your country or region? Do people in your country or region eat traditional food or international food? Track fifty-four. Now I'm going to give you a topic, and I'd like you to talk about it for one to two minutes. 
You'll have one minute to think about what you're going to say before you begin talking. You can make some notes if you wish. Here is a pencil and some paper. I'd like you to describe a personal achievement you're proud of. Track 55. All right. Remember, you have one to two minutes to talk on the topic. Don't worry if I stop you. I'll let you know when the time is up. Please start speaking now. Track 56. We've been talking about achievements. I'd like to discuss with you some more questions related to this topic. First, let's consider the role of achievements in the world of education. Do you think that in your country, academic success is more valued than other kinds of achievement, such as achievements in sport? In your opinion, is it recognition and prizes that motivate students to succeed, or is it a personal sense of achievement? What do you think makes some students more successful than others? Now, we're going to discuss motivation and achievement in the workplace. Some people think that a successful person is someone who earns a lot of money. Do you agree? Would you say workers in your country were motivated primarily by money? Do you think people in your country take the same pride in their work as they used to in the past? Thank you. It's been nice talking to you. Track 57. Sample answer. Hello, my name is Pauline Jenkins. Could you tell me your full name, please? Hello, my name is Marie Dupont. Thank you. Can you show me your identification, please? All right, that's fine. I'd now like to ask you some questions about yourself. Tell me about where you live. I live in Paris, the capital city of France. It's very famous for being a romantic city, the city of love. What are the advantages of living there? It's lively and fun, and you never get bored. You can find any kind of entertainment you can imagine, from bars and clubs to museums and galleries. What are the disadvantages of living there? Um, it's very crowded and quite dirty in parts. You have to know which areas to avoid, too, as some areas have bad reputations, especially at night. We're now going to talk about animals. What is your favourite animal? My favourite animal is the cat. I love cats because they're a lot of fun, uh, very playful, but also seem to have a bit of character, so it's always quite amusing to try to play with your cat. Why do you think some people like keeping pets? Um, I would suspect it's mainly for the company, so that they don't feel alone when they come home in the evening and they have someone waiting for them. I don't have any pets, though I used to when I was a kid. Are there any animals you're scared of? I have a phobia of snakes. I reckon it's because of the way the creature looks, and they can also be venomous. They're aggressive, so if they bite you, you can get very badly hurt. Um, spiders are another animal I'm terrified of. I hate the fast, erratic way they move. Are zoos popular in your country? Um, yes, they are, especially with kids. Kids love discovering new things, including new animals, um, and a zoo is the best place to do that. They can observe a wide range of animals in a safe environment. Let's move on to talk about food. Do you think men or women make the best cooks? It doesn't depend on the sex of the person, but on their enthusiasm. The men in my family are really good cooks, and they enjoy talking about food as well as cooking and eating it. Is it important to teach children to cook from a young age? The younger the better. Of course, you wouldn't give a young child a knife, but they can mix ingredients together and things like that. The younger they start, the better cooks they'll be when they grow up.
What is a typical dish from your country or region? Hmm. Lots of people think we eat frogs' legs all the time. It's a kind of national stereotype. But actually, I've never eaten them. I would say a more typical dish is steak with chips, and it's one of my favourites. Do people in your country or region eat traditional food or international food? We eat both. I regard it as very important to keep culinary traditions alive, but I also love Chinese food and Japanese food and Indian food and loads of other cuisines. I like having variety in my diet. Now I'm going to give you a topic, and I'd like you to talk about it for one to two minutes. You'll have one minute to think about what you're going to say before you begin talking. You can make some notes if you wish. Here is a pencil and some paper. I'd like you to describe a personal achievement you're proud of. All right. Remember, you have one to two minutes to talk on the topic. Don't worry if I stop you. I'll let you know when the time is up. Okay. Please start speaking now. Okay.、Uh, so you asked me to talk about an achievement I'm particularly proud of. So I could have talked about when I passed my university exams,、uh, or when I bought my first home, but in the end, I decided to talk about the only time I actually won a sports tournament. Only once did I win my village tennis tournament.、Um, it was when I was fifteen years old. It was particularly difficult because, to be honest, I'm not a great tennis player. And I always played mainly to have fun and not really to win. But that one year, I decided. I made it my goal. I was going to win the village tennis tournament. So I played many matches, lots of them against older players, much older than me, who were members of the club in their fifties,、uh, and it was very difficult. Playing older players is always tough. They have more experience. They do all these impressive tricks, and they definitely know how to beat their opponent. And on top of that, it's very much a matter of pride for them. They don't want to lose against one of the younger members of the club. But anyway, I won a few matches against older players, and、uh, then I ended up playing the final against my best friend. And that was another difficulty. He was my best friend, so I didn't want to play it too mean with him. But at the same time, I wanted to win. At least the fact that he was my best friend meant that I knew exactly how to beat him, though, because I had played against him many times before.、Um, we had a very long game, and it was nerve-wracking. It wasn't very good tennis, but in the end, I won. I'm very proud of my achievement because I managed to reach the goal I set for myself, and it was something that I know neither the spectators nor the other players would have expected me to accomplish. Thank you. Was your family proud that you won the tournament? Yes, they were. We had a big meal to celebrate, and my dad cooked all my favourite things. He's a great cook, so that was a real treat for me. We've been talking about achievements. I'd like to discuss with you some more questions related to this topic. First, let's consider the role of achievements in the world of education. Do you think that in your country, academic success is more valued than other kinds of achievement, such as achievements in sport? No, I don't. I think in my country, successful sports people are looked up to more in society at large as well as at school. Why do you think that is? Well, I think people who are good students are often thought of as nerds and are teased by their classmates, whereas being good at sport is considered cool. Maybe this is due to the role of celebrity sports people. Uh, David Beckham being the most prominent among them in recent years, they are chased by the paparazzi and given lucrative sponsorship deals, and so on. Yes, I see. 
In your opinion, is it recognition and prizes that motivate students to succeed, or is it a personal sense of achievement? I would say they hanker after recognition from their teachers, and perhaps envy from other students.、Uh, I know that was the case for me, if I'm honest. It may be though that if someone is particularly timid, they would actually shy away from any special recognition of their efforts. Right. And what do you think makes some students more successful than others? Although, as I said, most students are motivated by recognition, I do think that those who are the most successful in the long run are those who have intrinsic motivation, and that is because you don't always get congratulated publicly for everything you do. So, someone who does things only for that would soon stop making an effort. You know. Yes, that's a good point. Now we're going to discuss motivation and achievement in the workplace. Some people think that a successful person is someone who earns a lot of money. Do you agree? No, I would define it as、um, someone who benefits others. Right. Can you explain what you mean? Yes.、Um, I mean that working just for the money could be considered selfish. Most people do it, and I don't judge people for having that as their primary objective. Nevertheless, those who work to help others are more inspirational. Nurses, for example, who really don't earn much, or youth workers, who often don't get much appreciation for their hard work, or those who do voluntary work with the homeless, or something like that. Yes, so you would say that most workers in your country were motivated primarily by money. I would. Yes, it's only normal. People have families to feed, and given the choice of a low-paid job that benefited others and a higher-paid job that benefited their own family,、uh, it's only reasonable that most would choose the latter. It's possible that those who choose the former kind of job are single or young, and so don't have that many responsibilities. Okay, and what about how things in the workplace have changed? Do you think people in your country take the same pride in their work as they used to? Hmm, that's a tough question. I'm inclined to say no. Why do you say that? Because many people in my country now work for huge companies, they may never even have seen their managing director and certainly don't know him or her very well. They don't have any reason to take pride in doing the job to a high standard because feedback is limited. Um, in the past, companies were not only smaller but tended to be family-run, so everyone had something invested. I mean, personally speaking, in the business, they cared about the success of the business. Thank you. It's been nice talking to you. Thank you very much.